Uh, for those people who uh, don't know me, my name is uh, Kevin Hilton. Uh, I'm chair of the Leeds Beckett Race Equality and Diversity Forum, and it's great to see so many happy, smiling faces with full stomachs uh, here at our annual race lecture. If you have a look at the have a look at the programme. This is the order of things, but we're just slightly out of sync. Um, I'd, I'd, like to, I'd like to introduce our uh, Deputy Vice-Chancellor, Phil Cardew, uh, in, in a second, who is um, our senior race champion, um, as designated in our Race Equality Charter Mark Action Plan. So it's something that we felt necessary, we, we needed. He was somebody we felt necessary to have in that particular position to engage our, uh, our senior executive team in issues uh, uh, specifically uh, around race. So I'm going to ask Phil to come up uh, in, uh, in a second just to, um, to, to offer our institutional welcome <coughs> to you. Um, whilst Phil is, is getting up out of his seat, could you just check your mobile phones uh, and just check that they're on mute or off or whatever it is you need. Uh, I'll do the same, all right, mine's on mute. Um, uh, and then we can, we can keep things flowing. Uh, so, so just moving things on, I'd like to welcome uh, DBC uh, Phil Cardew, the uh, Senior Race Champion at Leeds Beckett. Uh, Thank you very much, Kevin. And um, firstly, a warm <coughs> welcome to everybody. Um, it's nice to see so many people here this evening. It's also very nice to hear that I'm needed for something. I'm, I'm very <laughs> seldom told, I'm told I'm needed for something, so that's a, that's a really reassuring part of, part of life. I'm, I'm not here to say anything um, long-winded or, 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 or of uh, any great import, because it's, it's David that you're here to, to, uh, to listen to. And having he heard him speak at a um, round table that Jason organised earlier in the year, I know what a, st a stunningly good speaker he is, so uh, I'm looking forward to his, his, his talk as much as anyone else. What I would like to say is, you know, firstly, you know, as I said, thank you all for being here, and thank you for showing your commitment to the, the work that we're doing in this area. I do think it's important uh, work, um, and I know Kevin is going to give some thanks at the end. So I, I, just just to, to reinforce the fact that I, I, I join in with his thanks to uh, to everyone who's organised the event this evening. It's all gone um, very well, been very well planned. I'm also very much um, wanting to re you know, re reinforce the fact that we are, as a university, committed to race equality. We are committed to working and getting our race equality charter mark. We weren't quite as successful as we'd like to have been the last time we, tr we tried, or first time we tried. Um, we're, we're meeting and recouping and, uh, uh, and reinvigorating our work there, and we'll do everything we can to make sure the action plan we put in is, is, is something that's both real and works and reassures the, uh, the Charter Mark uh, folk that we're, uh, it, we have good intentions in this area. Um, it's not an easy thing to get right. Um, and we need to get it right, um, but uh, we'll keep on on every every level to do that. So I won't um, take any longer at that. But uh, <laughs> Tony's already just <laughs> telling me I'm past my job by date. <laughs> Thank you, Phil. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, it's it's a real honour and privilege for me to uh, welcome Professor David Gilborn uh, to Leeds Beckett University. Um, I, I remember uh, a, a number of years ago at the Institute of Education uh, where Dave was doing a, a keynote. Um, I, I, I had the pleasure of introducing him then, but what I did was I took his, uh, I took his kind of pen picture and I started to read off it. And about three or four minutes later I was still reading it, so Dave said, just don't bother doing it this time because you know, clearly Dave has a, a, a international standing and is a great... Uh, at great renown. Um, it would be a, a real challenge for you to write anything on race uh, and education without drawing on uh, Dave's work. Uh, I've been drawing on Day, uh, David uh, Gilborn's work for over two decades. <laughs> I'm sorry. Scary. <laughs> for, um, for, for over two, uh, two decades, uh, decades. And his work is necessarily and clearly transdisciplinary hence uh, the range of people uh, the range of people in this room um, so 
uh, without without further ado, I'd like to I'd like to introduce uh, Professor Dave Gilborn. He uh, is the, the managing uh, editor of Race, Ethnicity, and Education. Um, professor of Critical Race Studies at the University <coughs> of Birmingham. Um, and director of the Research Centre for Race, Ethnicity and Education. Um, I've asked Dave to, to speak for about, uh, about 50 minutes, um, and then we will have a, a, a question and answer session that I'll facilitate, and I, w I will ask... Okay, maybe a bit less. Um, <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> um, so so uh, we're, we're then going to have a question and answer uh, session that I'll facilitate, um, where I will ask DBC uh, uh, Professor Phil Cardew to to join uh, Dave to offer our <coughs> institutional uh, uh, response. Um, so I'd like to uh, to introduce and welcome uh, Professor David Gilbert. Thank you very much. So the first thing to do is to get the right slides up because um, I can't speak without slides. Yeah. That was rather remiss of me, wasn't it? Yeah. Up there somewhere. That's it. Uh, I'd like to say that when, when Kevin and I first met, um, it's so long ago that I had hair. But I didn't have any hair then either. Um, all that's happened is the little bit of hair that I've got has gone white rather than um, how it looks in the rather scary picture on the leaflet. So I apologise for that leaflet. Um, so, well, I'm going to look at how racism operates in the policy and the practice of education. And if any of you were here for the event um, earlier in the year um, that Jason um, organised, <coughs> There's 10 minutes in the middle that's going to be awfully familiar because I'm talking about the lies that people tell us about race and education and there's one particular lie that's very important and which they keep on telling. So I figure that I really ought to keep on trying to debunk that particular lie for as long as they keep on telling it. So forgive me if uh, in the middle there's a 10 minute section where you suddenly feel like um, this is awfully familiar. That's how I feel every time I turn the TV news on and hear the same things year after year being told that it's just been discovered. So I'm going to look in particular at higher education and achievement at the end of compulsory education and I'm going to draw largely on evidence from the English system but I'm also going to draw some um, links with what's happening in the US. Along the way I'm going to say something about critical <coughs> race theory which is an approach that both myself and Kevin um, use uh, very prominently in our work. It's an approach that's gaining international traction um, so far as trying to not just understand how racism operates but also do something about it and oppose that racism. I'm going to begin with a couple of quotations that will hopefully set the scene, the kind of context for the um, arguments that I'm going to make. The first is drawn from an email that I recently received uh, and the email relates to a new journal that I've launched with my colleague Dr Nicola Rollock. The journal is called Whiteness and Education and it's an offshoot from the journal that Kevin mentioned, Race, Ethnicity and Education, which we launched about 20 years ago. So the email said, in response to your creation of a journal to study whiteness and education, I would like to share with you some video links on the subject of white privilege in America. I find what you're attempting to do to be offensive and threatening. Power and relationships in society is an important topic, but to associate power as being intrinsic to skin colour or based in skin colour is a mistake and, let's be honest, racist. So I looked at um, the videos that uh, I've been sent and in the first 20 seconds of the first of the three videos, uh, someone called Ben Shapiro, who's a well-known US critic of what he calls political correctness, he described white privilege as, and I quote, this is a technical term, a leftist bullshit term. <laughs> now, I think it's quite interesting and significant that somebody would bother to write to a journal editor saying that their journal is threatening 
and then include links to such an angry and irrational piece. So that's the first quote. The second quote relates to the first quote, as you'll see, quite closely, but it's from a very different source. It's from a leading philosopher and critical race scholar, Charles Mills, and it's on the topic of white ignorance. White ignorance, it's a big subject. How much time do you have? It's not enough. Ignorance is usually thought of as the passive adverse to knowledge, the darkness retreating before the spread of enlightenment. But imagine an ignorance that resists. Imagine an ignorance that fights back. Imagine an ignorance militant, aggressive, not to be intimidated. An ignorance that is active, dynamic, that refuses to go quietly. Not at all confined to the illiterate and uneducated, but propagated at the highest levels of the land. Indeed, presenting itself unblushingly as knowledge. Now, I suspect that the author of the email would be very unhappy with this quotation. They'd say that Mills is being racist. He's calling white people ignorant. But of course, Charles Mills isn't calling white people ignorant. When Charles Mills and other critical race <coughs> scholars talk about whiteness, we're not attacking white <coughs> individuals. We're critiquing the operation of a system, <coughs> a system of beliefs, discourses, and actions that collectively support and legitimate racist inequality. <coughs> so when we talk about whiteness, we're describing a racial ideology. These are beliefs that saturate society. They shape the curriculum. <coughs> they find expression through mainstream political and media discourses. And they present themselves as obvious, common sense, and unremarkable. So this research is an attack on whiteness as an ideology. An ideology that supports economic, social, and cultural dominance by white elites. It's <coughs> not an attack on every white person. It is possible for people who are seen as white to act against racism and for racial justice. Similarly, it is possible for people who are labelled as of minority ethnic heritage to support whiteness and to work against the interests of, mi of their minoritised peers. So Mills's quote reminds us that this is a fluid and a highly complex <coughs> problem. Whiteness fights back. It's aggressive, it's dynamic, and it's propagated <coughs> at the highest levels. Now, this view of racism as a kind of taken for granted, enormously powerful, but everyday um, phenomenon, <coughs> this is one of the central tenets of the approach known as critical race theory. CRT started in American law schools in uh, the 70s and 80s. And these are some of the key founding writers in critical race theory. Since then, CRT has moved from the law into lots of different disciplines. And education has become one of the key places where CRT has really grown uh, and morphed, not just in different directions, but also internationally. It's now much more prominent as an international movement. These are some of the key people writing about critical race theory in, if you like, that second generation, uh, both in the States uh, and here in the UK. And the reason I've bothered to put their pictures up is that critical race theorists don't look like the people who most scholars think of when they think of theorists. They tend to think of dead white men, usually <coughs> from France or Germany. These are the leading critical race theorists, and as you can see, they're an incredibly diverse bunch, but the vast majority of them are, using the phrase from the States, people of colour. They're minoritised people. They live these issues on a day-to-day -day level. Now, obviously, I can't give you a comprehensive account of critical race theory in the time available tonight, um, but one of the most important <coughs> aspects of CRT is this view of racism as being deeply ingrained in the everyday life of society. To quote um, two of the founders of the movement, <coughs> CRT begins with a number of basic insights. One is that racism is normal 
not aberrant in American society. Because racism is an ingrained feature of our landscape, it looks ordinary and natural to persons in the culture. So they don't mean that racism's normal, it's fine, everybody's racist, let's ignore it. They mean it's normal in the sense that it's everywhere. We're often told that racism is this kind of exceptional thing that only happens now and again. It's really crude, violent, horrible, but it hardly ever happens. No, in CRT, racism saturates the society. So it offers a complex and a multifaceted approach to understanding <coughs> and opposing racism and looks for racism in its everyday, mundane, often unrecognised forms and seeks to highlight how racism is working in these everyday uh, ways. Another key aspect of CRT is taking seriously the experiential knowledge of people of colour. So alongside analysis of racism in the media and politics and using statistics, critical race theorists are often at pains to put at centre the lived experiences of minoritized people. And so that's one of the approaches I'm going to use in terms of looking at six lies. If I had longer, there are more lies. Um, <laughs> but these are some interesting ones which talk about how racism operates through the very basic things we're told about education. I'm going to draw on data from England and the States, <coughs> and of course sometimes things do work differently on different sides of the Atlantic. But as many people have noted, particularly uh, Paul Gilroy and my colleague um, Paul Warmington, the history of race and politics and education in the UK cannot be understood <coughs> in isolation from the politics and the history of the Caribbean and the Americas. And at the moment, the parallels between Brexit Britain and the 2016 presidential election campaign, those parallels are, are painfully clear. In particular around the idea of white people as a kind of threatened ethnic group. And I want to start with an area, looking at the first two lines, an area where the similarities between the US and the UK are so close that it's often impossible to tell the difference between the experiences on one side of the Atlantic and those on the other. And what I'm going to do is to look at how students of colour experience life in universities. And this lets me look at two lies together. First, the idea that critical race theorists exaggerate the importance of racism. And secondly, that universities are welcoming places where all that matters is merit and hard work. Now, obviously, the people that attack critical race theory don't say that racism's disappeared entirely. They tend to argue that racism still happens, but it's limited to one or two bad apples. It's an exceptional um, thing that happens because of uneducated bigots, the odd individual. And the reason why the race equality charter mark is so important is that it forces universities to say no we recognise we are a racist <coughs> institution, here's the evidence and here's what we plan to do. Because the vast majority of people that work in universities <coughs> are assured that they are there simply because they're cleverer than everyone else. And the only reason why anybody would be denied access or denied promotion is that they're not clever enough. Now, I'm going to look at these kinds of arguments um, by looking at the experience of students of colour on a day-to-day -day level because that paints a very different picture. And I'm going to start by drawing on a campaign, I Too Am Harvard, which many of you will be uh, familiar with. It's a multimedia campaign that sprang from the work of Harvard student Kimiko Matsuda Lawrence. And the campaign drew attention to the reality of being black in one of the world's leading universities. Similar campaigns sprang up around the world and if you just look at a few of the websites some of the parallels become very striking very quickly. So I'm just going to put up some slides taken from the I2 campaigns at six universities, <coughs> three in the States, three in the UK. And as you'll see there are some disturbing similarities. So you're going to see a series of slides with students holding up things that has been said to them uh, in their universities. And the first set of samples 
are people born in the country where they're studying and yet treated as aliens, including a student at Wisconsin Madison who was asked, where are you really, really from? <laughs> and an Oxford University student who relates the following, where are you from? Birmingham. No, where are you originally from? Birmingham. Now, at first, these kinds of things can seem almost comic that people in universities separated by an ocean experience identical problems. But there's nothing funny about the constant and systemic messages of exclusion and control that underlie these kinds of events. In universities that are supposed to be educating the cream of the next generation, people of colour are left in no doubt that they don't fit in. Their real origins are quizzed and they're treated as novelties. A common experience is for people of colour, born and raised in the US and the UK, to be viewed as foreign, but to be complimented on their command of the English language. Moments like these are often referred to as microaggressions. Richard Delgado describes them as sudden, stunning or dispiriting transactions, like dr water dripping on sandstone, <coughs> they can be thought of as small acts of racism. Their cumulative weight is devastating. They reveal and they sustain the racist inequalities at the heart of the system. So for example, <coughs> students of colour are often told in many different ways that they simply don't belong in elite institutions. So the Harvard students here who are assumed to have gained entry because of a racial quota. They can't possibly there be there because they have the ability to be there. And a Cambridge student who's treated like a tourist inside his own college. So inside his, his place of residence, he's challenged by a porter who assumes that he must be there because he's a tourist. The various campaigns also highlight the gendered nature of racial microaggressions with black women being treated as strange objects of fascination and white people assuming they have the right to touch them and question them about their appearance. A quick glance through the various campaign websites reveals countless examples of hair touching. In particular, white people assume the right to police their peers of colour. White students expect minoritised people to fit into certain boxes they're expected to look a certain way. And if they don't fit the white stereotype, they're open to challenge and ridicule. So the Harvard student who's told, you are so not black, and a Cambridge student told, if you're from Africa, why aren't you black? Minoritized students are also expected to act and sound a certain way. So a black student at Oxford is accused of being a bounty. The fact that they're at Oxford means they can't possibly be authentically black. And a Harvard student is told, you don't sound black, you sound smart. <laughs> Perhaps most significantly, students of colour are policed about the acceptable way to talk about race. So a Harvard student notes, when you speak your mind, it's confidence. When I do it, it's sassy and an Oxford student refuses to play their appropriate role. She says, no, I will not stop being so sensitive so you can carry on making jokes about my race or religion. These students are exposing and resisting the everyday practices that put white students and white faculty at the centre of normality. The assumptions that view white people at elite universities as legitimate, hard-working, high achievers, but construct people of colour as outsiders, anomalies, people who must have got there by some kind of illegitimate means, whose very presence at the university defines them as not being appropriately black. The final statement I want to show you comes from a student at Cambridge University. Her mouth is taped shut and her board reads, so I can't talk about race because it makes you feel uncomfortable. This picture speaks to the remarkable double standard that governs popular <coughs> and political discourse about race and education at this time. 
Derek Bell, one of the founders of critical race theory, laid out these processes more than 20 years ago in an essay called The Rules of Racial Standing. Bell argues that essentially what we say about race is judged on the basis of two things. First of all, our racialized identity. How are we identified racially? And the content of what we're saying. Are we supporting the racist status quo or are we challenging it? So white people are generally assumed to be capable of rational, balanced thought on race issues. They're assumed to be well-intentioned and reasonable, whereas people of colour are assumed to be biased. They can play the race card. Their intentions are assumed to be self-serving and negative. There are two key exceptions to this. First of all, white people who speak out against racism are incredibly suspect. Why are they saying that? Um, what have they got to, to win from this? They must be doing it for the money. You'll see an example of this later on. The other exception is people of colour who defend the racist status quo. They're granted superstar status. They're suddenly described as individuals of courage, valour. These are people who fight against political correctness. They're, they're assumed to automatically be speaking the truth. Now, you see the rules of racial standing in play all the time on both sides of the Atlantic. And at the moment, the situation is becoming even more toxic. Um, there's a growing sense on both sides of the Atlantic that white people are now the real victims of racism. So the EU referendum provides a very clear lesson in the power and the dangers of trying to appeal to white racist fears and anxieties. Leave campaigners have been very quick to argue that Brexit wasn't about racism, it was about sovereignty. But often those arguments are completely <coughs> indistinguishable. The Daily Express, for example, might argue that its headlines in the lead up to the referendum were really about the need for sensible immigration controls. But in the month leading up to the referendum, the headlines kept striking the same note on and on. One of threat, soaring numbers, crisis, invasion. The racism at the heart of the debates was viciously exposed by the rise in racist assaults that followed the referendum result, what some have called celebratory racism. And this hatred has been building for years. Anti-Muslim hate crime rose by more than 300% in 2015, the year before the referendum and the recent spikes in race hate. The image of white people as race victims has been built systematically over the last decade. Let me show you an example. In 2008, the BBC ran a series of programmes called The White Season. The trailer showed a white face being slowly obliterated as it was covered in non-English writing. And the season strapline asked the question, is white working class Britain becoming invisible? The season made headline news on the basis of an opinion poll commissioned by the BBC, which only spoke to white people, obviously. And the statistics from the opinion poll were used to show the, the, the magnitude of the problems that were being unearthed. So Newsnight launched the series of programmes and they, they filled the screen with the numbers from certain of the questions uh, in the survey. So they cited the poll to argue that most white working class people said that immigration is a bad thing and that you're labelled a racist if you dare to say anything negative about immigration. After the season of programmes had finished, the polling company published the whole set of results. And it was really interesting to look at some of the results and the questions that hadn't been mentioned <coughs> anywhere. And remember, this was done by the BBC, who were generally the <coughs> most trusted source of news in this country. So some really interesting findings from the same poll had gone unreported. They could have used the same poll to show that most white people think that drink and drugs and a lack of respect 
are bigger problems than immigration. Or that about three quarters of all white people said that immigrants fit in if they're given sufficient time to do so. Now that last finding could have been used to completely turn the whole immigration debate <coughs> on its head. Most white people actually think immigration's fine. Give it time and it's fine. But instead, the findings were entirely ignored. <coughs> Any sense of complexity, gone. Presumably because it didn't fit the editorial line, that immigration and multiculturalism are dangerous and white people are angry and afraid. Now the US offers a very clear example of just how far these lines of argument can be taken, how far legislators will go to protect the interests of white people. The case I want to talk about is in the state of Arizona. In May 2010, the state signed into legislation a bill that withdrew all funding for schools guilty of teaching prohibited courses. A prohibited course is one that does any of the following. Promotes the overthrow of the United States government, <coughs> promotes resentment toward a race or class of people, is designed primarily for pupils of a particular ethnic group, or advocate ethnic solidarity instead of the treatment of pupils as individuals. Now the legislation meant the end of an incredibly successful and radical program known as RASA Studies. This was a community-based approach to critical pedagogy that honoured the voices and the experiences of the Latinx community. The course had shown incredible results. Not only did Latinx students on the course score higher in the state's standardised tests than other Latinx students, they graduated at a higher level than their white peers. So it didn't close the gap, it left the gap way behind. But the state closed the course down, not because of achievement, they said, but because of resentment. Specifically, it was argued that the course was anti-white. Tom Horn was a key figure in the debates. He was in charge of education in Arizona when the bill was enacted and he used the ending of what he called ethnic studies as a major part of his campaign when he ran to become Arizona's Attorney General. He ruled that Raza studies violated the new law and in particular he honed in on what it had to say about whiteness. These materials go on to state anger, guilt and shame are just a few of the emotions experienced by participants as they move toward greater understanding of whiteness. If one were to substitute any other race for whiteness, it would be obvious how this promotes resentment towards a race or a people. Now, this is a really neat trick. He's conflating a critique of whiteness with an attack on white individual people. And he called the course racist propaganda. So in effect, the Arizona statute outlaws all critical discussion of whiteness and the actions of white people as a group. The law mandates a colorblind account of the world where actions and decisions are taken by individuals alone. Any critical account of whiteness or white people as a group is defined as racist and illegal <coughs> in state funded schools. So the Arizona reforms make explicit what's already implicit in education policy pretty much on a global scale. White interests and fears are given priority. Whiteness is seen as normal and unexceptional. Non-white identities are defined as other, as ethnic, self-serving and inherently dangerous. And criticism of white people is ruled out because that would be racist. <coughs> Similar moves are gathering pace here, where politicians across the political spectrum take turns in calling for greater immigration controls, and where we're told that multiculturalism is a failed ideology that breeds discontent and is unfair to white people. And education has been at the forefront of pushing forward these kinds of arguments. 
where the interests of white people are now unashamedly at the top of the education agenda. Which brings me to my next lie. The last few years have seen policy debate dominated by the supposed educational failure of the white working class. So these are a selection of headlines from 2008 to the present, constantly presenting white kids not just as underachieving, but very often as the underachieving group, the lowest of all ethnic groups when it comes to achievement. Now, this message is reiterated year after year after year, and it's built by some very clever manipulation of the education statistics. Uh, and I'm going to take you through how you build such a successful lie. There are really three parts to the process. First of all, you have to forget about overall educational achievement. This slide shows the proportion of kids in some of the principal uh, ethnic groups and the height of the column shows the proportion of kids getting five higher grade GCSE passes including English and Maths. Um, and the table includes all students in state maintained schools. <coughs> so kids in private schools aren't in here. These are just state maintained schools. And I've highlighted uh, the white British group in red and as you can see they're not the highest achieving group but they're far from being the lowest achieving group. So that's very inconvenient. You can't write those headlines based on how kids in the main ethnic groups do in school. So what you have to do is look at a different group. So politicians and newspapers ignore the overall pattern and they only focus on a selection of the population. They focus on kids who receive free school meals, the poorest section of the pupil population. So if you take out from these numbers everyone who isn't receiving free school meals, the levels drop. They drop for all groups, but they particularly drop for the black British group. But, as you can see, even doing this, the red bar is not the lowest. Okay, white British kids, even amongst those in receipt of free school meals, are not in any way the lowest achieving group. So what you have to do now is a really smart trick. Basically, you ignore the groups that don't fit the pattern. So politicians and newspapers don't talk about the educational achievement of travellers, gypsy and Roma pupils. If you pick up the paper, whether it's the Daily Mail or the local paper, if there's a mention of travellers, it will be a mention of the dangers of a new site, the dangers that somebody's moved in, the threat to the local community. It won't say, how is it that travellers are so much left behind in the state education system? They're simply ignored when it comes to those debates. The third part, and this is the really horrible part of the, the, the trick, is you don't talk about kids on free school meals. You talk about working class. This is really important and it could be an innocent attempt to make the statistics more intelligible. Um, students in receipt of free school meals is a bit of a mouthful. It's easier to say working class. So it could just be innocent. It could be. It's not. Because <laughs> most, most British adults think of themselves as working class. And this is this is year after year. The, the um, <coughs> British Social Attitude Survey for about the last 30 <coughs> years turns up the same proportion. About 60% of adults say, I'm working class. So 60% of adults, when they see those headlines, think you're talking about them. They are working class. But free school meals doesn't cover anything like 60% of the population. The vast majority of people who think of themselves as working class aren't in receipt of free school meals. They're not counted in those statistics. Overall, nationally, about 14% of students are on free school meals. And this slippage in language is crucial because when you take data that's about free school meal kids, the most economically disadvantaged part of the population, and you talk about them as if they are working class, you're telling the majority of the population that they're students are experiencing something which is actually very particular to a much smaller 
group of students. And you're obscuring those wider inequalities of achievement, which I set out at the beginning. And this is not a kind of academic debate between a few statisticians. This stuff is changing policy. This is a government advisor. This is what they look like. Um, on the basis of data specifically about free school meals, he drew these conclusions about the need to prioritise white kids as a whole, all white kids. Why is it that white kids are doing so much worse? We have to tackle that as a society. For the future of Britain, it obviously matters more to tackle white underperformance just because there are more white people. Now, since making these comments, he's been promoted. He is now the chief analyst and senior ministerial policy advisor at the Department for Education. This is the guy that explains to the politicians what the statistics mean. So this is not just some, some geezer writing an article for the Sun. This is the expert on education saying that we need to prioritise white kids. And of course, if white kids are the underachieving group, who needs race equality? Since 2010, there's been a war on racial justice in education. So the part of school funding that's tied specifically to the proportion of minority ethnic students, that's not ring-fenced anymore. So head teachers can spend that on anything and anyone that they want. Many local authorities used to have things called ethnic minority achievement teams. In most parts of the country, they've gone. I, I'm not aware of one that hasn't been reduced in size. In most parts of the country, they've simply disappeared. And within six months of the election of the Conservative Lib Democrat coalition, every single national um, initiative meant to support the recruitment, retention and promotion of black and minority ethnic teachers, every one of those initiatives was abolished. So since 2010 there hasn't been any national support for having more BME teachers in schools. And it's really important to realise, those of you that were here earlier in the year realise this already, I've been banging on about this for a while, this is not news to people, this kind of misunderstanding about working class and free school meals is not a misunderstanding. In 2014, <coughs> the Education Select Committee produced a report specifically on the issue of white working class underachievement. I appeared before the committee, uh, the research centre that I direct at Birmingham, we sent evidence in, uh, and on page 8 of their report, they acknowledge, yeah, we were right. Free school meals doesn't equal working class. They say the logical result of equating free school meals with working class was that 85% of children are characterised as middle class or above. It's nuts. Of course it is. That's crazy. But actually, two pages later, for the sake of pragmatism, they say we're going to go off and do what everybody else does anyway and we're going to use free school meals and working class interchangeably. And so the result of them doing exactly the same thing that they've already said just doesn't make sense is another round of headlines saying exactly the same things about the underachievement of white working class children. So in this context race equality is now defined as at best irrelevant at worst it's the cause of white working class failure. This is the front page from earlier this year of the country's biggest selling newspaper. The Daily Mail circulation figures are now bigger than the Sun's. And it's been the single most politically influential paper for many years. This headline encapsulates the state of educational debate in this country. A wide range of voices now rush to condemn any moves towards race equality as dangerous, self-serving and destructive. And this is my fifth lie. The lie that by talking about racism, anti-racists are causing racism. So for example, the Office for Standards in Education 
who are supposed to assess standards across the country, think that teachers are so dedicated to anti-racism that they may have felt discomfort addressing the needs of white kids. A past teacher of the year in a report by the Centre for Social Justice, which despite its nice sounding title, is a very right wing uh, pressure group. Teacher of the Year quoted complaining that white kids are often ignored and humiliated by schools who are too keen to promote a positive image of minority communities at their expense. He's actually quoted saying the only white person mentioned all term is Adolf Hitler. And a university professor, a past joint president of the UCU, which is the largest union in further and higher education, I'm actually in this guy's union, <laughs> wrote an article when the research centre that I direct, when we were launched, he wrote a blog all about how dangerous it is that the University of Birmingham has set up this centre because we use this thing called critical race theory. And he describes critical race theory as a nice little earner, so we're in it for the money told you that was coming <laughs> and he says that by attacking racism CRT causes and I quote permanent hostility between racialized groups he says that critical race theory is recreating racism so the world gets turned upside down so attacking race equality now shows that you're the best kind of person you're courageous you're straight talking the only true advocate of racial harmony is someone who attacks anti-racism. So, for example, following the Black Lives Matter protests, it's progressives who are racializing America with what this author calls an incitement to heightened racial consciousness. All of this from a white observer who detects what he calls, and I quote, a powerful strain of racial superiority to these supposedly anti-racist protests. How dare African Americans protest that they keep being killed? Who do they think they are? And this kind of assertion is not limited to libertarian sites on the internet. During a select committee meeting, a conservative MP branded any kind of positive action for race equality as racist. If he was working in a university, he ain't getting the race charter mark. Because he's saying that the very things that you have to do to take race equality seriously are by definition racist. Now, this matters because it removes the possibility of serious critical debate about the state of race and education. And I'm going to show you really why this matters so fundamentally by drawing on a few more statistics. I apologise, I know the statistics aren't, aren't, aren't sexy. I'll try and explain them um, in language that makes some kind of sense. Um, but you need these statistics to make sense to debunk the final lie, which is that by raising standards, everyone will benefit. As we raise standards, the inequalities of achievement will close. Governments have been saying this certainly since the late 1960s. And to address this, I'm going to look in particular at the black-white achievement gap. I'm going to draw on research that I've been doing with my colleagues Nicola Rollett, Paul Warmington and Sean DeMack. And this is a project funded by uh, the Society for Educational Studies. We were funded to look at what's happened to race and education in the 20 years following the murder of Stephen Lawrence. But actually, if you're looking in particular at the achievement of black Caribbean <coughs> students, the data goes back a little bit further. You actually have a full quarter of a century. So I'm going to focus in particular on the gap between white students and their black British peers who would identify their family heritage as at least in part um, black Caribbean. And I'm focusing on them for two key reasons. Um, the black Caribbean community has often been at the forefront of arguments and campaigns for race equality, particularly in education. If you trace back the whole history of multicultural education, anti-racist education, parental mobilization, it was black teachers and black parents that were forcing these things forward. And as I say, we can actually take this data back further than we can for most minority ethnic groups. 
we can go back right to two, uh, 1988, rather, when the GCSE was introduced. So what I'm going to do sounds quite simple. I'm just going to draw you the gap, the proportion of kids in the black group and the white group who got the benchmark figure in their GCSE exams each year in the last 25 years. So this is the pattern between 88 and 2005. At that point, the benchmark was the proportion of kids getting five higher grade passes. And as you can see, the two lines are quite separate and they're kind of different trajectories. So white kids' achievement goes up consistently. Year on year on year, the blue line gets higher. Whereas black kids' achievement goes up, it falls down, it goes up, it falls down. There's only one point in, in this set of figures where the white rate falls back. And the reason that there's a gap between these dots is that there's a massive change in the nature of the statistics. The first set of statistics are drawn from a, a sample of kids. It's a nationally representative sample, um, but it's only a sample. <coughs> After this point, the figures relate to every kid in a state-maintained school, but only state-maintained schools. So after this point, the advantage is the figures relate to a lot more kids, but only kids in state schools. Private kids disappear. And I suspect the reason the white group fall back is that you've taken out all the white kids that are in private schools. So it's not surprisingly that if you compare all white kids with kids that are only white kids that are only in state schools, the overall achievement drops back. That's, that's what you'd expect. But even setting all of that to one side, the overall differences is pretty clear. There's a consistent gap and the white kids are the ones going up year on year. One way of thinking about the size of these gaps is something that statisticians call odds ratios. And you can type the numbers into Excel and it does the calculations for you. Basically what it does is to compare what are the odds of getting the benchmark comparing one group with another. So in this case, what are the odds of a white kid getting the GCSE benchmark compared with a black Caribbean peer? So here the odds are 2.86, that's nearly three. Three means that white kids are three times more likely to get the benchmark than their black Caribbean peers. The best situation is when the odds are only one and a half. So white kids at that point, the smallest gap, is when white kids are only 50% more likely, half as likely again, to get the benchmark compared with their black Caribbean peers. So that's pretty bad. Then in 2006, the benchmark measure changes. The Labour government introduced what they call the gold standard. So from 2006, it's no longer good enough to just have five higher grade passes. You have to have within them English and maths. So what happens when you make the benchmark more selective is that overall achievement drops. But it drops more for black kids than it does for white kids. So the gap gets bigger. White kids at that point have almost twice the likelihood of success compared with their black Caribbean peers. Over the next few years, achievement starts to rise and the gap starts to close. But then, in 2011, the benchmark changes again. At this point, the coalition government decides that 5As to C, including English and Maths, is not selective enough, and they introduce a new measure called the English Baccalaureate. And to get an E back, you have to have passes not just in five subjects, including English and Maths, you also have to have two sciences, a foreign language, and at least one of history and geography. And so what happens is achievement in that measure drops off a cliff, but again, black students suffer a bigger penalty than white students. Whenever qualifications are made more selective, race inequality grows. So too does class inequality and disability inequality. When the EBAC was introduced, white kids had more than twice the likelihood of success than their black Caribbean peers. And the last time that the odds of success for black kids were that bad was in 2003. So effectively, the introduction of the EBAC 
wiped out eight years of progress in closing the gap. And if we complete a 25 year span, you can see that the odds of white success relative to black kids at the end of the 25 years are pretty much the same as they were at the beginning of the 25 year period. And that the smallest inequality in the whole of that quarter century was in 1999 when black kids were only 50% more likely to get the benchmark measure. Now, these findings are really important. You've got access to them before most people. They're not even published yet. Um, what this shows is that black achievement has been rising, but it hasn't been rising quickly enough to close the gap, partly because once that gap gets to a certain level, the measure is changed and that makes the gap bigger again. So race inequality grows when the system requires higher levels of achievement. It got worse under the gold standard, it got worse under the EBAC. What will happen under the new government's brand new, fabulous, all singing, all dancing ideas about grammar schools? Well, the public debate about grammar schools has been entirely about class. In particular, kids on free school meals. I haven't heard a single word about race and grammars. Now, I've already shown you that the, the message of the last quarter of a century is that when the system becomes more selective, the black-white gap gets bigger. There isn't a lot of research on race and grammar schools. What research there is suggests that the pattern will repeat. Earlier this year, an official review of evidence was published by the House of Commons Library, found that black kids, Pakistani students and their Bangladeshi peers are less likely to get into local grammar schools. So Theresa May talks about a Britain that works for everyone, but her flagship education reform looks almost inevitably destined to make race inequality worse again. So I've used 50 minutes, let me summarise where I think this leads us. What I've tried to do is to look at the lies that shape contemporary education policy and practice. I use the phrase white lies very deliberately. Some people talk about white lies, oh it was a white lie, you said it to kind of, you know, it was for their own good, it's a nice kind of lie. I don't mean white lies in that way. I mean lies, these are fake, they're false, they're lies, but they're white in the sense that they benefit white people, particularly white elites. So I examined the first two lies through the experience of students of colour attending elite universities in the US and the UK. Their experience of racial microaggressions powerfully exposed how racism saturates the day-to-day -day reality of higher education. The way they look, talk and behave is policed by white racist <coughs> expectations. At any moment, they can be told that they simply do not belong in an elite and therefore white environment. The third lie promotes a view of white people as the real race victims. I looked at the case of Arizona where Raza Studies was closed down by the state, despite or maybe because of the fact that it produced exceptionally positive outcomes for minority ethnic students. The course was judged to be anti-white and <coughs> therefore illegal. This view of white people as race victims is taken to a new level in the fourth lie. I showed how statistics are manipulated, contradictory evidence is ignored and politicians and the media go on promoting a hysterical view of white failure as if it were a fact. Under the cloak of this lie, years of progress in changing policy and practice to promote racial justice is simply wiped away. Through the fifth lie, we now have a situation where to say the kind of things that I've just said is to be a racist. And in relation to the final lie, I showed our talk of raising standards often camouflages reforms that make inequality worse. The same effect seems certain if the number of grammar schools is increased. This is the world of education in 2016. A world where white racism is asserting its power and its authority more every day. 
and where critical race discussions are shut down as being racist against white people. There are no quick fixes to this situation, but progress won't happen unless we recognise the deep-rooted and racist power structures that saturate the everyday world of schools and universities. None of us can change this in isolation, but every one of us has the opportunity to do something and the responsibility to speak out against these lies whenever we meet them. Because if we don't, they will go on waging war against race equality. I'll shut up at that point. Thank you.